Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you for this Labor Day weekend, and we just thank you that, um, that we can open up your word, and we can look at it, and we can, we can draw important things, Lord, that can encourage us, Lord, that can help us focus this week on you and being used by you. So we pray now that you would use Pastor Izzy now to speak to each one of us as you so awesome, in such an awesome way you always do. We just pray that we'd have ears to, ears to hear and eyes to see what you have for us today. We ask that now in Jesus' name, and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Well, guys, would you turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 1? We're going to start our study through the second epistle that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. For those of you that weren't with us, we, we went all the way chapter by chapter, verse by verse through the whole of 1 Corinthians. So those of you that have been with us, you have a head start on the goings-on of this letter. But if you're just joining us, this is... Just for a quick background, this is a, a church, the church at Corinth, that Paul actually was the one the Lord used to pioneer, uh, plant the church, he called a church planter. You know, he was on a missionary journey when he stopped there. And uh, when he was there on his second missionary journey, he, he stayed a year and a half. And he planted a work there, it sprung into a church, and it began to blossom under his leadership. And then the Lord told him, time to go. And, uh, and so he headed back to uh, Antioch where he was from and passed through Ephesus and, and Caesarea on his way back. And then after just a, a short while, Paul got, um, I, you know, I call it restless legs. I mean, this guy, he, he already had gone two missionary journeys. And the first one, you know, was a small loop around, around Asia Minor. And then he said, on the second try, he said, let's go back and visit the churches that we already planted, see how they're doing. And that was his, in, his intent. Now, sometimes we have something in our mind, what we think is going to happen. And you notice sometimes God always um, steers us in maybe a different, a different direction. While we're on our way doing what we thought we were going to do, Paul was on his way thinking, I'm going to just go back and visit the churches and then uh, partway through his second missionary journey, that he had a, a night vision, it says, of a man from Macedonia calling and saying, come over to us, come over to, you know, help us. And Paul took that to be the Lord telling him to go over there. And you read about this in, in, uh, in the book of Acts. And so you'll see in the book of Acts that all of a sudden around chapter 17, the, the um, pronouns change from he to we and it's believed that Paul crossed over to Macedonia and picked up a fellow that we know as Luke the author of the book of Acts and so from then on the rest of the book of Acts is narrated in plural form you know we did this we did that instead of he did this he did that in the beginning part so he went to Macedonia and then he wound up going over to Corinth and he and he planted the church and he and he hung out there and then after go returning back home, he gets itchy feet. Now, for those of you that don't know this, I, I'm one of those. I, how many of you like to know, like, what date something happened? You know, like, when's the, when did he write this? I, I'm kind of chronological. I like the timeline. Just put, put me a mark on the timeline so I know where I'm at. And uh, if, if you're that way, just I'll help you out on this. Because Paul, Paul went on his second missionary journey from 50 A.D. to 52 A.D., about two years in that, in that journey, okay? A year and a half was spent at Corinth. So they got the lion's portion of that journey. The third missionary journey, he's going to turn uh, basically a quick turnabout and from, from his, uh, you know, uh, 53 A.D. to 58 A.D., five years, the next, the, the third missionary journey, you see all those little lines in the back of your Bible map, you know, Paul went here and went here and went here. That's a five-year trip. And by the way, there was no airplanes or, you know, what was the mode of transport back then? Your little feet. Yeah. You did a lot of walking. <coughs> Once in a while, he got to take a ship and ride on a boat, but that didn't work out all the time. They sunk. He, he spent a night and a day in the deep, remember? 
and uh, he was at great danger from the seas, he says, and, and they even wanted to uh, kill him, you know, aboard. He, this guy did not have great travels. In fact, he had some pretty bummer uh, events. If you read the book of Acts carefully, you'll see that they, they wanted to stone him, and well, they actually did, and they threw him over the wall of the city into the rubbish heap. It was like into the, what we call the dump, you know, but it was over the city wall. They just stoned him to death. <coughs> Excuse me. After they stoned him, they just chuck him over the wall into the trash pile and not, not even worthy of a burial. And you guys know what the Lord did, right? Get up, Paul. Raised him from the dead and said, keep going. And Paul went right on preaching the gospel. I mean, this, this guy, he was going to suffer a lot for the, for the sake of the Lord. Now, some people ask me, does it, do you know how old he was? And that's a, that's a good question. I'm one of those geeks. I like to, to like study, you know, like try to find any clues. But Paul, it says, um, and what, uh, there was a historian named Josephus. Really dry read. I don't recommend it. But if you want to pick up little nuggets once in a while, you can find stuff like Paul was born in 8 AD. How did he knew that? I, his, Josephus was a historian. Paul was such a radical character that he made it into this, what we'd call the secular history books of the day. I mean, it was like making the newspaper or whatever. I mean, you know, the Chronicles, you know. Josephus was writing what was going on in the, in the region. And this guy, Paul, actually um, made a note in the history. He made history books tell when he was born. So the fun part about that for me is I go, okay, if he was eight years old at... Uh, I mean, if he, if he was, I'm sorry, born in 8 AD, eight years after, be eight years after Jesus. Okay, when Jesus born AD 1, uh, 0, right? We change from BC to AD. BC before Christ, AD, Anno Domini. The year, Anno is a year, and Domini is in Latin for the dominant one, the master. The year, we, we say in English, the year of our what? Lord. So Paul is uh, Jesus is about eight years old when, when Paul was born. Now, later they're going to lay the robes of some men that stone a certain guy. I'm not going to tell you who in the book of Acts. And I'll tell you, who do they lay the, the guys that were doing the thro rock throwing, where, who did they hand their robes to? This young guy named Saul, who happens to be later have his name changed to Paul. So he's going to be, he's going to be um, having this happen. And around... <clears throat> 32 to 36 A.D., Paul uh, has that, that he's out persecuting the Christians with the letter from the rabbis. And on the road to, to Damascus, the Lord meets him and converts him. He says, Saul, Saul, why dost thou persecuteth me? And he does a quick, I call it a quick uh, comeback. Who art thou, Lord, that I might serve thee? And he goes, I'm Jesus. And so Paul doesn't immediately consult with anybody. In fact, the scripture tells us he's somewhere between 24 to 28 years old at this point. And the Lord brings him out into the desert and has a little schooling with him. We, we would call it in-depth, uh, what, what would it be, seminary experience with Jesus. And, the, and, and we have a clue from the book of Acts. Luke was kind enough to tell us that the Lord taught him one of the first things that he needed to know. And guess what it was? Saul, I'm going to show you how much you will suffer for my name's sake. Now, we know that from the book of Acts. The topic, now we don't have the whole, you know, outline of the, um, of the lesson plan, but we know the topic. The topic was, Saul, now, did Saul cause suffering for the church up to that point? Yes. And, you know, sometimes people say, man, those guys that are enemies of the cross, I just wish they were dead. I go, yeah, that's, a, that's, really, that's really shooting too low. You know, you got to raise your aim a little higher. Instead of praying that they be dead for your enemies, pray that they would be converted. See, because God doesn't mind a zealous person, even if they're zealous for the wrong. Because he can take that zeal and he can swing it around and, and he can take it and he can make that person zealous for the gospel. And what better way to, to fix the problem than taking this guy that's a persecutor and make him into a proclaimer of the gospel. The Lord just goes, oh, I got a better plan. Now, how about if we did this for all our enemies that were persecuting us or persecuting our country? Do we have any enemies of our country? 
for those that don't travel, let me give you a little heads up. You know, if you do a little trips around the globe, you'll find out America's not the love nation. Not, not on other shores. And, uh, and there's a few enemies of, of America that would just love to see us infidels. That's what they call us in the Middle East. Un the unbelievers, they want us to see us killed. Absolutely scoured from the face of the earth. I've spoke to men right face to face over in Syria, over in Damascus, that just, they, they just, the hatred in their eyes. And you're just like going, Lord, I know they hate me, but if they could just have that much zeal for you, you know, like if you could just, if you could just touch them with your grace like you touch me with your grace, that would be super cool. And the Lord told me, quit praying that, you know, because I, I kind of learned the David style prayer because my middle name's David. You know, when I read in the Bible, David's like, Lord, get my enemies. And he, he kind of sounds more like get them like I'm thinking get them. It's Sicilian style, you know, take them out. And, and I, I thought that was a good spiritual prayer from the Psalms. So I realized what the Lord did with Saul. The Lord got him, but instead of, instead of just taking him out, he converted him and put him on the team. And did Saul, now called Paul, did he get used by the Lord at all? I mean, you talk about a great, a great turnaround. The, the guy that was so zealous against the gospel turns out to be one of the guys that is the most zealous for the gospel. And by the way, we have about half our New Testament because of this guy's zeal for the gospel. But I want to point out to you, it was not easy road for him. He'll go off into the desert for 13 years. He says he doesn't immediately consult with flesh and blood, but he begins to search out the scripture and seek the Lord. And he comes back a powerhouse for the Lord. So around 24 to 28 years old, he gets saved at 13 years. And then somewhere around 38 years old, till he's 41, three years that first missionary journey took, took to do. So for those of you chronological lovers, that's, that's from 46 AD to 49 AD. This is the best dating I can do, like taking all of the details that we have from the scriptures and, you know, putting it to the events what we have and the whole trips on in the book of Acts and all the details that that we can find from history books this is the best as I can give it to you now don't don't like go well Pastor Issy said this is the exact no this is this is like the closest period I can put the marks on the timeline it, it could it could shift a couple years this way that way don't don't focus on that focus on this I can tell you that that because of some of the clues to me, it's very interesting that the Lord would save a man 24 to 28 years old, give him some in-depth one-on-one seminary, teaching him what he was going to suffer, and then send him out at 38 years old. And that man would go on to serve the Lord for three missionary journeys. From 38, he's going to go all the way till he's 50. 12 years of solid missionary experience by this man only to come back and then get arrested and then sent to Rome and then, well, he's going to die at age 59. So around 60, 65 to 67 AD, the, um, the historians tell us that that's when Paul was, um, he, was he was released, then rearrested, and then beheaded in Rome. So a man that was used so much of the Lord by the time that he's 59, he's done. Oh, now, I, I only say this because I'm turning 55 on November 11th this year, so I'm, it's making me contemplative. If, this, if I go as long as Paul, I got an earlier start than him. I started serving the Lord when I was 16. So I got the early, you know, I got him beat on the early side, but I'm, I'm coming to about the same number of years before the Lord took him out. Now you wonder, why would I even think like this? Have any of you ever felt like what if the Lord took you out right now? Or have any of you had a bad, I mean, a, I'm talking bad day, like where you're so bad, you're like, this, the, lo, the, the cares, the worries are so heavy, they, they, they're like paralyzing you. You, you feel like, you, you, I hate to say it this way, but almost like you despair of getting up in the morning because you just, you despair of life. You're just like, anyone here, just, just honest show of hands, anyone here ever felt like you just wish it was over? 
and you're done. You know, like just besides me and Pete and Diana and Aaron and just a few others. <laughs> I mean, there's just certain days you feel like, I wish I was finito. And I look at Paul and I'm like, gee, I've done about as many years service as him in the Lord. And, and you know, I'm really glad he wrote chapter 1 of, first, of 2 Corinthians. You know why? Because he's going to share something that even he felt that way. That even Paul the Apostle that was used so mightily would actually feel despairing of, even of life itself. I'll show it to you. It's right here in this first chapter. Let's read together verse 1. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ Jesus, by the will of who? Not, not Paul, that's for sure. By the will of God. He said, and Timothy, our brother. Now, remember when we just finished second, uh, 1 Corinthians, Timothy, Paul had written about him in the last chapter of, of second, uh, 1 Corinthians, saying, Paul, he, he had, he says he's writing this letter with Timothy. Now, Timothy is that young man that he refers to in another epistle as his son in the faith. His son in whom he says, there is no one as like-minded in the gospel as this young man, Timothy. Paul was like, this, guy, this kid has caught the vision of the work of the ministry. And by the way, when I say the work of the ministry, the word minister, it, it sounds like a really fancy professional title. Do you guys know what minister means? It means servant. It's a servant. It's a really classy title for slave. What do you do? I'm a slave. You're a slave. A slave of who? Of Jesus. I'm a minister of Christ Jesus. I'm a slave, a servant of Jesus. It's not really that, it doesn't sound all that fancy when you just say slave or servant. I'm just a servant of the Lord. But that's what Paul introduces himself to the church as. I'm just a servant. I'm, I'm a servant of Christ Jesus, and I'm writing with this young man, Timothy, who also, he had said, if he, if he comes to see you, remember at the end of 1 Corinthians, if he comes by, help him on his way. He's, he's worthy of help. He's, he's doing the work of the Lord. Well, we obviously know that he gets to Ephesus where Paul was, uh, when he wrote 1 Corinthians. And by the way, that would be about 57 AD, uh, I'm sorry, 56 AD when he wrote 1 Corinthians. And 57 AD is when he'll write 2 Corinthians. In response to the situation that he, that he uh, hears back upon, uh, about what was going on, the update from the first letter. And then around 58 AD, still, uh, I believe, there and around Ephesus, that time of serving in the ministry there, because uh, he spends two years there, he writes the book of Romans, one of my favorite books that uh, will come to, you know, just, just power packed for transforming your life. If you ever want to see your life transform, just study the book of Romans. It, it changes you from the inside. Really powerful words in that book. Well, Paul, Paul says, Timothy's here with me, so we're writing this letter together. So he says, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints throughout Acacia, Achaia, some people pronounce it, Acacia, depends where you hear it in the Middle East. They say it two different ways. Doesn't matter to me. Same place on the map. He says, grace, shalom, uh, sh uh, or, or I'm sorry, cheris and, and shalom, peace, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Cheris is the Greek greeting when you would meet someone. Cheris, you say, um, it's like saying, Instead of aloha, like we do in Hawaii, where you're saying, um, you know, uh, it's an it's a expression, a, a Hawaiian expression of breath of love and life, you know, to greet a person. They say grace in Greek culture, grace to you. And in, in, in uh, Hebrew culture, they say shalom. So peace, it's just the, it's their equivalent of when you say hello, you say peace to you. In, in Hebrew culture, shalom. So Paul actually gets both, knowing that there's Jewish believers, there's, there's Gentile believers, so to the, to the Gentiles, the Greek-speaking ones, they would, they would say, you know, cherish or, or grace, and to the ones that are he Hebrew-speaking, shalom. So if you want to look it up in its original language, that's what it's going to say. It's not going to say grace and peace. It'll say cherish and, and shalom. To you from God our Father 
and to the Lord Jesus and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, he says, and the God of all comfort. To be really honest, you could do a whole sermon on this verse. Because our society has twisted the, the, the picture of who God is. A lot of people have written things about God saying God must be mean. He must be a, a judgmental, cranky old guy up on his throne with a big stick that's always trying to thump me one. Because because the nuns used to hit me. I'm pretty sure, you know, if they hit me, they were representatives of God. So, so God must be waiting with a ruler, a big, you know, the almighty ruler to whack me when I get out. Any of you here, like I was raised, you could tell, Italian Roman Catholic boy. Went to catechism, did, was an altar boy, you know, learned Latin mass. They didn't do mass in English when I was a kid. And, uh, and when the, you got out of line, the nun, if you got in trouble... She took the ruler first and hit you with it this way, the, f the flat way. That was your first warning. You're really bad. She turned it this way, the little slicey way, whack, and get you. And they didn't have no rules about you can't leave a mark, because I know. I mean, I, I was not always the kid who held still. I had trouble holding still. I think they would call that like something like ADHD or something today. But, but I move around a lot. And, and the nuns would be like, sit up, sit still. And the, and the little wood chair would, like, my little, my little scrawny butt bones, am I allowed to say that in church? They, they would hurt in that wood chair. And I'd be like, squirming and squirming, sit still, whack. And, you know, I can understand when people say, well, God must be mad at me all the time because those nuns were always mad at me. And they work for God, right? They're like his representative. And if, he, if they're mad at me, then God's mad at me. And... And w the problem with that is you're making your, your view of who God is based on what? On a, on a person down here, maybe who is not quite representing him the way he's described. See, it's a Paul said that, that, that blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus. The Father of what? Of mercies. Now, mercy is literally... A withholding of punishment. It's, it's holding back what you deserve because you did something wrong. So a merciful God would say, you deserve a, a whack in with this ruler, but guess what? We're going to put the ruler away because my son already paid for your, for your indiscretion there. That's mercy. See, he's the father of all mercy. But unfortunately, sometimes we had a bad example, so we don't see him through that lens of super merciful. We see him as judgmental and not, and not mercy. Well, Paul says, did Paul receive mercy, by the way? Think about it. The guy writing this is the guy who was persecuting Christians and should have died, but Jesus went, I'm not going to kill you. I'm just going to convert you. Now you're on my team. In fact, I'm going to put you on the A list and you're going up front to the front lines. You know, Time to put you in the battle. And, and you're going to suffer, buddy. Now, some people think that that's mean that Jesus would tell him he was going to suffer, but I think that if you really, I think he actually does, the best thing I could tell you is if you're a Christian and you're just starting off, let me just give you a heads up. You will suffer. You're going to suffer at some point, maybe rejection from family or coworkers for your faith or for your, even for your morals. Maybe... You know, your coworkers is like, hey, everybody steals a pen from the office, you know, or everybody takes this or that. And they want you to do it. And you're like, I, I don't want to do that. It's not correct. What are you, holier than me? You know, has anyone ever had the persecution that comes when you just try to do what's right? And people get mad at you just because you just were trying to do what was right? I mean, come on. It happens. I'd rather tell you you're going to suffer as a Christian and there's going to be some problems that you're going to go through. Then tell you that it's going to be, oh, wonderful. Come to Jesus. You'll never have any problems. It's a, it's a bed of roses with no thorns. Everything is wonderful. It's all like great. That's, that's hogwash. Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have tribulations. But be of good cheer, Jesus says. I've overcome the world. We're going to have tribulations. 
And Paul says, God is the God of mercy. And he knew it firsthand because God showed him mercy. Now, you know, when you meet a man who knows that God is merciful, I don't know, there's something about, to me, it's like an instant connection. My, fellow, my, my spirit can fellowship with another man who he knows not the, standing right in front of me. I'm not perfect. He knows he's not perfect, and yet we both know God is a merciful God. When you, once you taste of the mercy of God, it changes you inside. And the next thing that Paul describes God as to the church at Corinth, it's really important to pay attention to the second thing. He's not only the God of all mercy, he's the God of all what? Comfort. Now, this is something that they nuns didn't teach me this part. I'm sorry. I mean, if you, now some of you are going to have different experience. You might say, but I had a great nun who told me God was the God of all comfort. Good. She probably read it right here. Yeah. Comfort. Whack. No, I mean, no. There are some, hey, listen, don't, don't ever like lump all the, all these people like that. That's wrong. Okay. There can be some real gems in there that just, it's just, it's our human nature that we try to, to like, what do you call it? categorize everybody in one big group. That's not correct. God looks at every person individually. But we need to look at God as He is, the God of all mercy, the God of all comfort. Wouldn't it be cool you went to church and the preacher goes, they go, what's the message on? That God is the God of all mercy and the God of all comfort. That's what the preacher said. God is there to comfort us. You guys know that, right? I hope you do. If you don't, this is just, you know, to, to, to inform you. If you know it already, this is just to remind you, because this is a good reminder. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.